Hey, good morning. Effort at Community Church, it is great to be with you once again. Happy Sunday to you. It is really exciting as people are starting to make their way into the room here today oh, as this church. And just want to recognize that many of you watching live right now um, are, some of you are from around the area. Perhaps you couldn't be here because of vacations or whatever it may be. But many of you are joining from out of state, out of the country even, yeah. and it's pretty amazing. So Thank whether you. you're watching <laughs> us live right now or you happen to be catching us later this week, uh, we yeah. consider you part of the body here. Just so yeah. thankful to have you joining yeah. us today. Here we're going to be continuing our series this morning on our Revelation series. It's our book study for the year, taking yeah. us through the summer. This is our third week in the series, and we're going to be hearing from Pastor Jim again here this morning. He was with us last week. Today he's going to be continuing, kind of picking up where he left off. So Wes, what can we expect from Jim today? Well, uh, also just want to remind you too, in this Revelation series, we've been reading through the book of Revelation yep. mm -hmm. and just being encouraged to read it from different translations. Yep. And so I think it was three weeks ago, we actually read through yep. it in the service and, and we've been digging into this. But today, Jim is going to tackle the message to the churches. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited. I think he's entitled Seven thoughts uh, for seven churches. In fact, there's worship notes there online that you'd be yeah. able to like tune into or, or get a copy of. But, um, you know, it's so awesome. Uh, Jim's going to touch on this and I'll let him unpack it. I won't sure. steal the thunder. Yeah. But this idea of how Jesus speaks and has a message for the yeah. church today, yeah. not just then, but today. Yeah. And we're going to be challenged in that. You're going to be challenged. And yeah. I was challenged in that last night, hearing the message. I'm eager to hear it again today. Yeah. But uh, I just love, Matt, how God's word is relevant. Yeah. Yeah. It is relevant to me, to you. It's relevant to the body of Christ, yeah. no matter where you're tuning in, even around yeah. the world. Like it is re relevant yeah. and God's word is relevant and yeah. God has a message for the church today. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear it. And so yeah. I'm excited to hear from Pastor Jim today. Yeah, he has a real powerful element here at the end. Yeah. Uh, out of John 15, Jesus is talking about the importance of pruning off yeah. Yeah. dead branches. He uses yeah. the illustration of a, of a vine rightly connected um, to Jesus, yeah. uh, but if, if it starts to grow branches that don't bear fruit, he cuts yeah. them off. And so God's heart is that every individual in his church and his yeah. church as a whole is bearing good fruit, right? right? So the seven letters right. are is a pruning communication. It is, it and, is. Uh, Which and isn't, the, doesn't always go feel good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But, <laughs> but I love, we know, we know that it is good, it right? Is. That it's, yeah. uh, And we know that, that Jesus is the gardener, so he knows exactly where yeah. to cut, yeah. right? Like, and where to prune. And, and you know wow. a lot about that yourself. Yeah, yeah, growing up on a farm. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. And you know, just recently, well, earlier this spring, I pruned my raspberries, okay. right? And they're not fun to pick because they're prickly, right? Oh, sure. But, but you know, it feels, you feel like you're doing violence to the plant by yeah. cutting it so hard and so deep, sure. but you know that the result of it is just amazing. Yeah. And that's just Jesus as our shepherd. Like he yeah. knows, I've been cut deep in my life sometimes, sure. and you have too, right? Yeah. Just God's pruning, but it's his graciousness and it's yeah. his love yeah. so that we can bear more fruit for his yeah. kingdom. And wow, that is really the heart message um, in this study today yeah. around uh, chapter two and three in Revelation, yeah. as we're going to hear from Jim here in a few minutes. Yeah, so, so as you're um, going through worship and as Jim is preaching, I just encourage you to hold yeah. your heart out before the Lord. Say, God, yeah. is there something in me that you want to prune? Availing yeah. ourselves to him um, as the shepherd uh, and as our Lord, you know, he is the God and his job in our lives is to bear good fruit. That's right. Uh, and so that's his, his goal. And so you avail yourself to him saying, Lord, is there something yeah. in me that's not bearing fruit? that you want to remove in this season. Yeah. And I, I promise you, you'll hear the Lord Amen. bring some clarity around that. Um, we're excited in just a few moments to be heading into worship. Yeah. And we encourage you uh, to gather your family around if you're watching live right now and just to engage with in worship with us here this morning. Uh, but want to let you know that here at ECC, our desire is to connect you with God and with others. That's and right. one way we go about doing that is through the Connect card. And we actually have a Connect card online. Yep. You go to effortofcommunitychurch.com slash connect. It'll bring you to that online Connect card. We encourage you, whether you're watching live right now or catching up later this week, we'd love to know that you connected with us through the service this week. Uh, so fill it out. Let us know that you were watching. Also, please let us know if there's any prayer requests Absolutely. that you would have. Every week we take time to pray for those. Um, and so please don't uh, hesitate to share with us something you'd love us to pray with you about. And also want to encourage you uh, to fill out uh, on that Connect card any testimonies, any ways that God has been moving in your life. We'd we love, love to celebrate. From you. Exactly. We'd love <laughs> to celebrate what God is doing. So we're going to be heading into worship here in just a moment. Thank you for being with us. We hope you're blessed and encouraged by the message. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you at some point here in the room, even at our First Steps room, if you're watching online. Please come over and just say, hey, I've been watching online for a while. I'd love to get to know you. Yep. All right, enjoy the service. God bless. 
Good morning, Ephrata Community Church. I want to invite you to your feet. Join with us as we enter into a time of worship.
Cause that's the power of your name Just the mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty That's the power of your name, just the mention makes a way, giants fall and strongholds break and there is healing, and that's the power that I claim, it's the same that rolled the grave, there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus, there's no power like the mighty name. that some of us need a reminder of that this morning. Do you guys believe that there is power in the name of Jesus? That all things are possible with God. He can move the mountains that are in front of us. He can break the strongholds. He wants to release that over you this morning. Faith to believe that he can do more than you can ask or imagine. So let's just sing that out. I see you taking ground, Lord. Your power is dangerous to the enemy. I see you taking ground. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's camp. You still do miracles. You will do what you say. Now as you've always 
Jesus, we just, we thank you for the power. We thank you for your victory on the cross, Lord. We just invite you into this place, Father. Would you come and work among your people here today, Lord?
declaration that worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive all honor and glory and power we worship you today Jesus I'm gonna invite you to stay standing we're gonna celebrate communion this morning so as you came in you should have received a communion cup 
If you did not, I'm just going to invite you right now to slip your hands up. Ushers are going to be looking around the room and making their way around. They'll bring you an offering, or I'm sorry, a communion cup if you did not receive one. So just leave your hands uh, really high and we will, uh, they'll get to you in just a moment. So we have been in the book of Revelation. Amen? Do you know in the book of Revelation, the term the lamb is used 28 times in reference to Jesus? Almost more than double of any other name for Jesus in the book of Revelation. The lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb of God who was slain. And I find it interesting that in the final book of our scriptures, as the story is getting wrapped up, so to speak, that John, the author, keeps pointing us back to this moment in time with Jesus on the cross and saying, don't forget, don't forget that the victory that is being accomplished here is the victory on Calvary. It looks like death, but it's actually life. It looks like a loss, but it's actually a win. The lamb the Lamb of God. The first time in the book of Revelation where we read about the Lamb is chapter 5, and I want to read it to you again this morning. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy? to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on, or, or, or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, the lamb. The lamb. The lamb who was slain. It looked like defeat, but it was actually victory. This is the lamb that we celebrate this morning. This is the lamb that we remember this morning as we celebrate communion. So I'm gonna invite you to take that communion cup and take the wafer out of the bottom of that cup while I read to you the words of Jesus to his followers from Luke chapter 22. And then we're gonna celebrate communion together. It says this in verse 19. And he took the bread, being Jesus, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we just thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken and given to us. And we freely receive it this morning in Jesus' name, amen. And then Jesus continues in the next verse. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new promise in my blood, which is poured out for you. Father, again, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. And this morning we remember and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite at this time, we're going to head back into worship in a minute, and we're going to make a declaration about the worth of the Lamb. But I want to dismiss at this moment our kids to their kids' ministry classes. They can feel free to head right out those back doors. And while the kids are being dismissed, if it's okay, I want to read another passage to you about the blood and the body of Jesus and what we have as we celebrate communion. So, 
In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us of something, something that seems kind of counterintuitive, but it's super important for us to understand. He says, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So we're not proclaiming his resurrection, which I find interesting. We're actually proclaiming the death of the Lord as we celebrate resurrection. It's because the victory is found in the death. It was the lamb who was slain who was worthy. The lamb, helpless, sacrificial, poured out. It was the lamb. It was the lamb that was slain that gives us the victory that comes. So this morning, let's go beyond singing. Let's go beyond the worship service we've just been a part of. And let's step into a declaration with all of heaven that was eagerly anticipating on the edge of their throne, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy to open the seals? Let's join with that chorus in heaven and make the declaration of the worth of the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, who is now standing at the center of the throne.
I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with you, your blood has purchased for God people from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> just thinking about what uh, Pastor Jim said a couple weeks ago, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord together. Um, I want to take just a moment and uh, welcome everyone, whether you're here in the room or watching this morning on live stream, we're glad that you're joining us. Uh, if you're visiting Africa Community Church for the first time, we want to extend a special greeting to you. Uh, we really are that you decided... Uh, are glad, are joyful that you decided to come out uh, today and worship with us, worship the only one who is worthy, uh, worship the Lamb. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, you'll notice in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's something we call a Connect card. We'd invite you to take that Connect card and give us as much or as little information as you're comfortable with putting on there, and then hold on to that card, and as the service comes to a close, one of the pastors will be over into this room uh, off to my left up here. Uh, we call it the First Steps Room, just a place to take that card from you, say hi, greet you. We've actually got a gift we'd like to give you as well. Um, so we'd encourage you to do that as the service comes to a close. Everybody else, take that Connect card, uh, fill it out, drop it, uh, drop it in the uh, receptacle as you exit through the doors at the end of the service. We love hearing praise reports and prayer requests come in. We pray through those every week. I think a couple weeks back, about a third uh, of the things that came in were praise reports. It was just so exciting to hear uh, what God is doing in your lives, in our lives as a community. And, uh, and we pray through those prayer requests as well. So thank you for that. And that can be dropped off in the receptacles as well as any offering that you have this morning as the service comes to a close. A little bit of uh, family news that I want to make you aware of. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Alex Smith and and Hannah Weaver on their engagement. So congratulations. <laughs> Not quite family news, but some news about Family Fest, a large community event that we host every year at the end of sup uh, September in Snyder Park. Uh, that event is now up on our website under the events page. So if you're interested in serving, that event takes about 260 people to help kind of lead. And every year there's always people and families that kind of jump on and help lead games or activities. And so all the details are up on our website for that. If you're interested in kind of putting that on your calendar and staying kind of ahead of September planning, that's there for you as well. And we would appreciate that. Um, I'm holding in my hand the uh, reading series for the book of Revelation. So so we put together a little bit of a, a path that you can follow reading through uh, the book of Revelation. So this is uh, on the table as you would exit out of the auditorium. Feel free, if you have not already, to grab one of those and be reading through the book of Revelation as we're studying through it uh, this summer. I want to also draw your attention to the 68 other announcements that you would have missed if you're not paying attention to the e-news. Um, every Thursday, we have an email that goes out that lists all the other activities, uh, family life and whatnot, that are happening in and around Ephrata Community Church. And uh, if you don't get the e-news, it's because we don't know you exist. Uh, but we want to know that you exist. So it's simply that we don't have your email connected to you as a person. And if that's the case and you'd like to get that information, you'd like to get that e-news, you can just um, fill out a connect card and drop that uh, at the end of the service and we'll have that information and you'll stay connected in that way. I want to turn your attention to the screens for a short video testimony followed by Pastor Jim who's going to come and continue the teaching on the series in Revelation. 
So one day when I was working, I had to uh, lift a heavy bin over a piece of equipment and I hurt my back and it was really painful. I came to church that Saturday night and the, the uh, speaker said that he, God had told him that somebody with a lower left back pain was gonna be healed that night. And my pain was in my lower left back. <laughs> so I went up for, uh, to one of the prayer teams afterwards and was prayed for and my pain in my back went away. And not only that, I've been suffering with plantar fasciitis for months and it was really painful and hard to walk and hard to stand and that went away as well. So both were healed at one time and I couldn't tell you exactly what they said when they prayed but um, I really believe that God was going to do something although I was afraid to claim it right away. I wanted to see when I got home if it actually was gone <laughs> and getting out of the car um, was my first major thing because I was in so much pain trying to stand up after sitting down and this time I wasn't. It was worth having the pain to have the healing because then I could share with my coworkers what God had done and that was really exciting to have that opportunity to just to share what God was doing and for them to be able to see how powerful He is. Don't give up because <laughs> I, I had my feet play, prayed for several times before that but it was in God's timing that it was perfect. And so keep trying, because <laughs> God does answer prayer. Yeah. Uh, there's quite a word in that, isn't there? It was worth having the pain so I could have the healing and I could tell others about the Lord. Friends, those are deep words, isn't it, right? I'm not sure if I'm there yet, maybe this message will help, but thank you, Laura Jean, for showing us a little bit about the life of faith. Hey friends, if you're visiting, I'm Jim, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's two weeks in a row, what are the elders thinking, right? <laughs> First time ever, that's a nervous thing. I do want to draw attention to Pastor Kevin, he is with the fifth and sixth graders this weekend, and, uh, and he'll be back with you next weekend. But I also need to confess a little bit of a frustration I have with our lead pastor, Kevin Eshelman. <laughs> Stephanie's already laughing at me. <laughs> That's his wife. It's a good sign. Um, because she might have one too. I don't know. Go ahead, Stephanie. But all that to say, <laughs> no, don't. Um, all that to say, man, I remember when I was in the pastors and directors programming meeting when we were talking about the upcoming summer series. And, you know, I was expecting the usual kind of... Um, you ask for it series, you know what I mean? The one where you get to ask questions. Matter of fact, that's what they're doing with fifth and sixth graders. Kevin's answering one of their questions. But Kevin's like, no, I feel like we're going to, we should be speaking on the book of Revelation. Now, due to performance evaluation stuff, I tend not to laugh out loud at him, right? Because he's my boss. But inside, I'm like, get behind me, Satan. Because there is no way. Um, <laughs> that I, I do not see a lot of merit in speaking about the book of Revelation because you remember last week I shared with you a little T trauma from my own church experience that I came from a tradition that tended to use the book of Revelation in a kind of escapism format, almost justifying non-activity because things were going to get worse and therefore we were actually a part of the will of God to be a part of the spiral and to try to be some quiet witness for those who have ears to hear and respond to. And meanwhile, there was something in me that was confused by what it means to be a part of a kingdom that's advancing in these days. Now friends, I didn't have an active critique of that community at the time, but I must admit, I think I told you last week, I call it like a law of, of divine discontent where something doesn't quite feel right and you're trying to figure it out. So when Kevin, I said, I want to talk about the book of Revelations. I must admit, my first thing was like, no, um, really. And then I left that go. I'm like, you know what? He's the spiritual head. We can do this. We got some good people. Maybe I'll tackle one weekend on one of the easy topics or something. Then you know what he said like two weeks later? I think I'm going to lighten my summer schedule. Jim, you're in charge of the July sermon series. And I'm like, what? He really did, didn't he, Chris? He's like, Jim, you're in charge of July. And I'm like, you turkey, <laughs> right? You rascal, right? There's, <laughs> there's a great word, you rascal, right? Um, but I'm so glad he did it in true fashion. Kevin hears from Jesus. And um, what a delight to be able to follow up that wonderful weeding. Wasn't the spirit of God beautiful the last two weeks? Matter of fact, 
It's here this morning, isn't it? Like, uh, Matt Swords always puts it this way, that the water table is so high around here, even a little bit of rain causes flooding. I am so glad to be part of a community that prays and expects God to come. The water table is high at Effort of Community Church, and a little moisture brings the presence of Jesus. And I just wanna say thank you, Jesus. None of us deserve what you do in these moments. Um, we are deeply appreciative, but it's been wonderful to be a part of this. But I, I have that rare privilege of when we're doing a series, particularly we're, we're literally going to be tracing the book of Revelation, I get to follow up on the tail end of the previous message. You remember where we left off? Um, Jesus shows up, right? Do you remember the first words out of his mouth when he shows up? It's almost like it's spontaneous. He shows up and he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, I am the beginning and the end. And do you remember what happens next? It overwhelms John. First of all, Jesus does that, and it says, and John turns and then sees him. Remember? And that amazing description of feet that are glowing like they're in a furnace from purity, eyes that are blazing, a mouth that has a double-edged sword coming out of it, a kind of overall aura that John said this, I fell like a dead man in front of him. And then I love what Jesus does. It's almost like Jesus has this moment where he realizes, whoops, came on a little strong there, right? <laughs> pull, that, pull the threads of that garment back a little bit. And I love what the scriptures say. He lays his hands on John and says what? Do not be afraid, man, right? And then he slips into the resume that we all need to hear you want to know what is great? I beat death and hell for you. Stand to your feet, because I have a vision for you. And because of the history of creating the scriptures, we put in chapters and verses. What we're about to study were the next words out of his mouth. The first words out of his mouth are words to the church. Now, friends, just to remind you, Revelation has seven visions in it. We call the first vision the letters to the churches. Friends, do you not find that interesting? You are about to see the cosmic war that defines all wars. It makes Marvel Endgame look like it's standing still, right? This thing is about to be unveiled. Six more visions and seals will be opened, etc. And Jesus starts with who? Oh, I want a church ready. Not just ready, I want a church that will join me in about what's going to, about to happen. Friend, this is a beautiful thing, except how many of you have read these seven letters, these seven thoughts, these seven words? Are any of you like me when you read them, they're just a, ee, a little bit uncomfortable, right? And it's part of the uncomfortableness has to do with, I think, just... He's speaking to them kindly, and it doesn't always fit our frames of how we think someone should be always talked to or approached when they're off or something. So at one level, there's just what I call a cultural discomfort that it's my job to work through because Jesus is at work in them. I don't have a right to define what I think the proper approach to a human being or a condition is. So I understand that level of uncomfortableness, but I have to tell you this, five of seven of them are struggling. Those aren't good odds, friends, for us. <laughs> Can I break that to you? There is an uncomfortableness. There's an uncomfortableness. Thirteen churches made up Asia Minor in that day. Thirteen. The Apostle John likely planted most of them because he was the lead at the church at Ephesus. Only seven get letters. I don't know about you. I want to be part of the six. <laughs> I want to be able to stand back and observe what God's opinion is to the church, but I don't necessarily want the church at effort a name. There's something in me that's like, oh, I want to do some, like, um, I, some, I don't know about you. Anyone notice? Most of us don't want a consuming fire. We kind of want a hand warmer. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> no? I'd like to keep my appendages warm. Um, <laughs> the hunters and the just backpackers in their midst knows what I'm talking about, right? I like to keep my appendages warm. Um, I, want a con I want a hand warmer. Consuming fire, eh, that's a little bit hot. Um, and Jesus, however, picks seven. Now, I want to have a little fun here at the beginning. Does anyone notice that these seven kind of crawl across like performance evaluations? Anyone ever have one at work? Anyone ever have a dud one at work, right? 
Like you, your company decided it's time to do performance evaluations and you kind of wish they didn't, right? Because there's nothing worse than a performance evaluation in the hands of a director or a manager who doesn't actually know what's going on in your line of work, etc. It's a little bit disorienting and confusing. However, in exit interviews, I've had the privilege of doing some work in management and, uh, and actually studies in management. They have proven that in exit interviews, if a company does performance evaluations well, they regularly get named as one of the most helpful things that the employee experienced when they were with the company. Did you hear that? When they're done well in exit interviews, employees are thankful for that thing. Guess what ranks as one of the things they're least thankful about if they're not done well? Isn't that interesting? It ranks high when they're not done well and when they're done well. There's something about a performance evaluation. And Jesus runs a 60-year performance evaluation on seven churches. Now, by the way, for fun, I thought I'd read to you. <laughs> Federal government employee evaluations. These are real things. Are you ready for a little bit of a chuckle? These are real statements that appeared in federal government employee evaluations. I'm going to put one on the board and I'll read the rest. I love this one. Since my last report, this employee has reached rock bottom and has started to dig. <laughs> what supervisor is allowed to say that? That's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Right? No, no, these guys, that's not even the good one. Sorry, I'm already laughing too much at my jokes. Don't laugh at your own jokes, Jim. <laughs> Some drink from the fountain of knowledge. He only gargled. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was for someone in the military. His men would follow him anywhere, but only out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> She sets low personal standards and then consistently fails to achieve them. <laughs> I know. Here's the last two. I'm going to save my favorite for last. I don't, it might not be your favorite. I just get a kick out of it. But here's the one before that. If you see two people talking and one looks bored, he's the other one. <laughs> and last but not least, meant, this was in a government evaluation, employee evaluation. Mentally speaking, he's got a full six-pack but lacks the plastic thing to hold it all together. <laughs> How many of us lack the plastic thing right now, right? Or a tour, it's kind of there. The can's wobbling or got stretched. Um, may the Lord give us all those plastic things to hold it all together. Hmm. So Jesus dives in to an evaluation of his church. Now I tell you, He's not doing it because he needs the kingdom to perform better. He does not answer one day to shareholders. He is sitting and he's speaking to the church because he knows we were meant for more. It is the burden of someone who loves something so much and sees its potential that there is almost an active pain on their heart to see that thing realized to its fullness. Do you not remember the opening of the book of Genesis? All the world lays in chaos. God dreams a dream over it, hovers over it, and decides that the answer, the true long-term answer to that chaos is to raise up people who are a kingdom and priest unto God. And they will create something beautiful. It began in a garden, and it was always God's dream for it to end in a city. Where he allowed the sophistication of the gifts, the culture, the things he built you to bring into the world. Creativity, art, great, great, great entrepreneurship. Consistent pouring in of formation into a few. He built us to do these things. But an evil one who wants to see all things turn for the worse decides that he wants to usurp that somehow to feed his own ego trip that got set in place long before, somehow to bring everything created, everything that this creator dreamed over, to bring it down. And you and I have given just enough sovereignty to self-originate creativity, beauty, and action in this world. And we decided to turn everyone onto his own path. And Jesus looks at this 
And he says, I will redeem it. So in that great opening to Revelation, it is no small thing where we left off last week and where Chris read this week, that the answer to what is about to be unfurled in all of these seals is the fact that some being reduced himself to a span and suffered under the very thing he came to save. And something about that act released power that you and I barely know of. Come on, what sat down this morning at the end of worship? You got a thread, a glimpse of a thread on the tail end of a garment of a king who's won authority. Doesn't just have authority. Never does he just unwield his natural authority. His authority in this book of Revelation is based in this. He was a lamb willing to be slain, and it confused darkness, it humbled us, and it reminded us who we were meant to be. He is standing there with the deed to our lives, and he says, you were meant to be prince and princesses in a kingdom, priests unto God carrying authority. There's more for you. So I want to make sure that we know that as we dive into these seven churches, they are the longing of a God, not for some kind of worship or self-glorification or justification, um, but it's this, I am telling you, I'm bringing you to your best selves. Look at yourselves. When you are at your best self, it is glory to my God, the Father, right? And so we dive into these seven, and I put in your notes he does something that I'm referring to as a seven-fold pattern of addressing the seven churches. I want to thank Wes, who turned me on to one author, as you can see there in your notes in the bottom. Much of this is his thinking that I've spent a couple uh, weeks working with and trying to bring it to us. But he identified that Jesus is incredibly consistent in how he does his assessment of these seven churches. Every single one of them begins with, the church being named. You know, we see this in chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel in the church in Ephesus, right? We see it then again in verse 12, to the angel in the church of Pergamum, right? He comes very specifically, and he speaks to communities. There were 13 of them. He chooses seven of them, and he speaks directly to what was going on in their world. I want to remind you that that is a little bit confusing to me, I understand that we have epistles from apostles going to churches to correct them, to instruct them, to exhort them, but you're standing at the opening of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the great matter of all things end times. If there's ever a time Jesus deserves to walk out on stage, glow hanging about 3,000 foot above everything on this earth, and simply say, to my people everywhere, kind of like a great general at the beginning of the battle, or William Wallace in Braveheart, right? Standing there, if there's ever a time for a great rallying speech to tell you, put all of your stuff aside, Put your tribal identities aside. I'm here to raise up a meta-level mega church that's going to do something. It is the opening to the book of Revelation. Instead, he says this, write that tiny church that is struggling in Smyrna and tell them that this is what I think of them. From the beginning of this Bible to the end, he has a story for each of us. And I don't know if a lot of us know how to let in that level of intimacy, that level of immediateness, right? I tell you, friends, if we say yes as the church at Ephrata, he might come and do a beautiful evaluation for us. But you must be ready if you ask for such things, right? Because it will come with a pressing. It will come with a pruning. But I tell you this, I am on the point in my own walk where I would rather be, I have never had more words spoken over my life than in the last month. I would trade them all in for more of his presence. I would trade in every gift right now to be pruned a little more for what I think he needs in these days. 
He does not need another one-shot wonder. He needs a church, doesn't he? If there is going to be a harvest, he needs a church, friends. He needs a church that has the presence of Jesus in it. I am not your lead pastor, but there's a part of me that would trade in all signs and wonders for three months if he would simply come with his presence and sit down for three months straight. Trade them all. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, when his presence shows up, those things come too. You're right. I want more of his presence for what he's trying to do in these days. And I'm firmly convinced that Jesus comes and he says, I have something for you, Ephrata. Do you want me to talk to you about it? Because he comes by name. You've heard me so many times. He loves to translate his story to us whether it's the Gospels and the four different angles, the tribes of Israel, over and over he seeks, how do I get to their heart language? Many of you have heard me tell you the story of the Barai people group in Papua New Guinea. I was working with YWAM and we were working alongside the Wycliffe Bible translators. Some of you remember this story. They spent 20 years among the Barai people translating the New Testament. But due to some persecution in that region, a particular governor had been elected. They weren't allowed to run any kind of trainings because the government was kind of on to them, like, well, yeah, you tell us you're doing linguistic stuff among the indigenous peoples, but really you're just preaching. So Wycliffe happened to be under pressure at that time. So they came to YWAM, they said, you guys don't mind getting thrown out of countries. Will you come and do the trainings? <laughs> you love that, don't you? There's your anointing. You guys are dumb enough to do it. It's like, it's like that old commercial, Mikey Likes Life cereal, remember that? <laughs> Is this stuff any good? I don't know, let Mikey try it, right? Let the YWAMers come in. So I was part of a team that trained in about three weeks of basic training we were going to give the village elders and, and you couldn't stop them. 70 elders were invited in and about 250 people gathered around the, the thatched lodge type hut that we were in. And it's interesting. Do you know that Papua New Guinea has a challenge? They have no sheep on the entire island. It's very hard in an indigenous community that's first learning abstract reading and reading linked to learning how to read and adapt ideas to reading. It's very hard to come in and say Jesus is the lamb that was slain when you have no concept of a lamb, right? So some of you have heard me say this, that the Wycliffe Bible translators did a survey of what that people group had as the most intimate domestic pet. Because back in Isaac's day, the lamb that Abraham likely sacrificed would have been his domestic pet. Because God has to get into your mind and teach you the stupidity of sin, that something beautiful and amoral dies for your mistakes, right? Something eventually pays for wrong, right? And that's the image that's going on when God says, takes a lamb and tells Abram to do this. Isaac's crying as Abram's walking away with the best lamb from the litter, right? And so they asked Papua New Guinea, what was their domestic pet? that lives in the home that the children play with? Anyone remember what it is? Pigs. Pigs. They live in the house. They're given names. Matter of fact, the human mothers breastfeed them. Oh, <gasps> dear. I said it out loud. I probably shouldn't have now that I said it. <laughs> Come on, people. Matter of fact, if you visit the Barai people group, they will argue among themselves over who gets to sacrifice their pig. Because if that pig is eaten at your welcome meal, you become a member of the family that gave the pig. And guess what? In that village, you're known by the pig's name, Wilbur. <laughs> Wilbur's visiting, right? Isn't that fascinating? So guess what the Wycliffe Bible translators had to do? They had to translate the New Testament, Jesus, the pig of God. <laughs> Does that cut across anyone's Jewish sensibilities? <laughs> right? Come on. My brother was there when they were reading in the book of Romans that God sacrificed his pig for them so that they could wear his name. And such revival broke out that they had to shut down the training for days because a spirit of recognizing what God did for the people fell on them all. The entire tribe became Christians, 2,300 people. 
And over the next two years, that tribe evangelized every neighboring. Wycliffe Bible translators sent in a bunch of researchers to research what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Jesus got to their heart language, didn't he? Isn't that amazing about our God? He will find a way into your heart language. And this is where I am heartbroken as one of your preachers or ministers. I can't speak all your languages. I ask the Holy Spirit to speak your language because we are mere people trying to talk about the greatest being who sacrificed and a power was released we do not understand. Show us your power. So when Jesus stands there with John and he over unfurls with his natural amazingness, he drives John back to say this, I'm the lamb that was slain. I died. I was raised to life. I hold the keys to death and hell. Do not doubt what we have to do right now as a people. The next words out of his mouth is to the church at Ephesus, write. To Jared, write this. To Bob, write this. Our Jesus knows our name. For some of us, that's uncomfortable. Second thing I notice Jesus always does for all seven of the churches, he announces one of the character traits that was used in chapter one. You notice this? Every one of the seven, he picks a different one of the things that were just declared over him. I am the one, you know, just to give you an example, for instance, in chapter two, verse 12, he starts with this. To the angel in the church of Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword, right? He names something that you've previously experienced with him as authority for why you should listen. He just, I want to suggest to you that he's naming things that he likely already did among that congregation. You follow me? He probably already applied that character trait in their development over the last 60 years. And he comes to him and says this, you know why I need you to listen? You know why I need you to tune in? I am the one who begins and ends what I start in you. And if you've lost yourself, if you've lost a previous revelation, you are an untethered soul who cannot hold on to that which I've given you. How many of us can say that, that we have lost, even squandered previous revelations and breakthroughs in God? I love how he reminds us. He comes and says, I have been to you before what you've needed. Let that be my authority in your life. Don't you love that he doesn't just come and says, I have a strong bicep, and if you don't do what I'm about to say, pop, right? All right, that was too vivid, right? Like, Pop, all right, he just comes and he says, I am telling you, call to mind the former things I've done in you. He comes and he declares something about himself. You notice the third thing that he does with every single one of them, except for Laodicea. He praises what is good in the church. Come on, how many of you grew up with what's called the compliment sandwich? Anybody, right? What's the compliment sandwich? You're supposed to practice this, particularly if you're married. And then your, then your partner goes, I know what you're doing. You're doing the compliment sandwich, right? That'll, <laughs> right? The compliment sandwich is share something neat, share the struggle, share something neat again, right? Anyone struggle coming up with both pieces of bread, right? <clears throat> That's a whole other issue. I tell you, Jesus comes, and I think there is no working a compliment sandwich. He's not calling to mind therapist's advice here, etc. He is sitting, and out of him flows. When he sees you, he sees you for what you are meant to be, not always for what you become. He walks up to Gideon, and he says, mighty man of valor, well before Gideon's ever out of the hole. And I tell you, Jesus comes up and he pronounces over us good. And some of us in this room actually wouldn't even know what he would say to you. But I am telling you, your dear sweet Jesus knows something beautiful in you. He pulls it out of everyone, right? Laodicea is a bit of a struggle. We'll chat with that in a little bit. 
But then in the next thing he does, he censures what is amiss in the church. Except for Smyrna and Philadelphia, he has something in every single one of them that needs to be addressed. He comes to that thing and he says, but I have this against you. The language is quite strong. He recognizes that I'm about to talk to something that you know should not be there. This is not unintentional sin. This just isn't, you know, there's two things that bring bondage in the world, sin and ignorance. This is not just ignorance and you need to grow. This is Jesus coming to five out of seven churches and saying this, you know you're doing something that I have previously spoken about. You know that you're bigger than that. You know you're capable of more than that. And friends, this is where this gets incredibly humbling. Five out of seven, Jesus says, you know you were meant for more. What are you doing? And there's the gospel, isn't it? Friends, is that not the gospel? I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. I knew what you were meant to be in human flourishing. I'm well aware what an empowered church living in the gift of my Holy Spirit looks like. Come on, get up, get up, stop it. But we grow numb, don't we? And we assume that this is the way life is This is the cross I bear. This is the challenge I face. I carry a victimhood that allows me, therefore, to have this activity in my life. Jesus does not talk about such things. He comes and says this, you were made for more. I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And he censors some of us. And every single time, in every one of the seven, he then gives a warning, if you keep going, you will lose yourself. Actually, I love what the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he says this, and the spirit, the God of this age is blinding the minds of those who are not believing so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God. Paul, talking to one of the most complex churches in the New Testament, says, do you not realize how this is happening? You are slowly getting blinded in your eyes. And I tell you, if you let it keep going, I have a warning for you. I love how God always loves to present a hope-fear consequence. A hope consequence is this. Turn from that which you're doing. Not trusting me. Not tackling that spirit of fear that you struggle with consistently. Sexually immoral sin and behaviors whatever it is he comes to us and he first calls us because he hopes we can be more but if our ears have gotten so deaf if our eyes have gotten so layered over with something like scales that must fall from them he will then pronounce a fear consequence i am telling you if you continue you will grow numb you will hurt more you will hurt others. Every church. He gives a warning. And then he gives an exhortation to every one of them. Every church, he says this, right? He says, let anyone who has ears hear. Let anyone who has ears hear. Friends, I don't know about you. This is a flat out appeal. Listen. Listen to me. I am telling you that which will give life. And I am telling you that which will bring death. You must listen. Is not he who formed the ears worth the time it takes to hear? And is he who not formed the lips for speaking, should he not be heeded when he speaks? Let anyone who has ears to hear. Friends, I want to remind the church that we are pruning resistant. We do not seek to hear new things. 
we tend to seek to deepen that which we've already heard. We tend to try to live in those things which have brought us some forms of security. That can range anywhere from a relationship that we feel insulated within. That can range anywhere from elementary formative words we received many years ago, right? We tend to hover around that which has fed us in the past. But has anyone noticed, if you want more of God, he will dismantle the safety of the nest that you're currently in. He will take you to some place extra, some place more, some place deeper. And friends, I don't know about you, I tend to be pruning resistant, right? God, matter of fact, five out of seven of us, according to these statistics, are pruning resistant, aren't we? Right? We tend to actually not want to pay attention fully to what the Spirit might be saying or what the Spirit might be putting fingers on. And friends, I'm not just talking about sin this morning. Some of you have been asked to step out in forms of ministry or faith or trust or entrepreneurship or depth of relationship, even though you've been hurt before, and you might be being resistant to the next great thing God is wanting to do in your life. We are pruning resistance. We tend to think that fruit will come. We're content with the fruit we have. And friends, you know what? I think that's okay. Can I, can I do something I probably shouldn't say? At one level, who am I to sit and to speak into every one of your stories and continue to challenge you toward advancement? At one level, I don't know all of your stories. But there is one thing I want to remind you of that because I carry it, I would rather do business in deep waters where I could drown because it's in deep waters where you see the work of the Lord. You see the sustenance of the Lord close to the shore. You see the wonders of the Lord in deep waters. I think he's raising up a church that deals business in deep waters. And so I want to be careful what I call you to, but I am asking for those who have ears to hear. Are you willing to listen today if he's putting his finger on something? Because together, we could do business in deep waters. This is the beautiful call of Jesus over our lives. I'll remind you, John 15 says this. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. You know what? I got to pause. I got to use language that I think is appropriate here. I, st- I heard from God I'm to read this passage over you. Spirit, I will trust this passage to you. I am the true vine. My father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit of its own. It must remain in the vine. Neither will you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But I tell you, apart from me, you do no good thing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away. It withers. And you know that such branches are picked up and thrown into a fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and I'm telling you it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. This will show that you are my disciples. Mm. This is one of Jesus' last teaching. John, starting in chapter 16, turns to Jesus' last week of his life and his passion. You are looking, John laying down one of Jesus' last teaching. He says this, Do you know what brings my father glory? Human beings fully alive in what he created them for. Fully stepping in with the authority. Friends, 
when the great worship scene of heaven breaks out, remember what they say? They worship that a lamb who was slain released a people to be who they were supposed to be, a kingdom and priests unto God. But let these seven churches remind us that most of us resist pruning. I want to tell you a story that happened to me. I was in India. Many years ago, it's probably 25 years now. And I have been invited, man, I was a young man. I was about to tell you how old I was, but then you can do the math and figure out how old I am now. So stepping away from that quick, you want to know my weight too? (laughs) Social security cumber, first street I lived on, pet's name. Okay, so... (laughs) <laughs> you're not going to find anything in the bank account so you can have all that um, <laughs> as you'll hear from this story um, yeah I was, I was young um, and I had this interesting thing I was in youth with a mission you ever hear of that crazy bunch I just told you about and um, I, I was starting to operate in my teaching gift at that time and I had one of the major directors in North America uh, invite me to travel with him to India to preach at church gatherings. And he said, Jim, I need you to prepare two messages. You're gonna be speaking at a large event of pastors being brought in. If you've ever been to India, this is not a 10,000 people getting together is not a huge thing, but I don't know, it's pretty amazing for the age I was, 12. Um, Just trying to (laughs) keep my age in check. Um, So all that to say, it was pretty amazing. Um, And I don't know, I I don't know if I had like an active, matter of fact, I've never been able to put fully my finger on what took place to me during that time. But there was something inside of me that's like, oh my word, I get to travel with Wick and I get to, and I get to minister to the church in India. And this thing came up in me around my gifts and my contribution in the world and stuff. And so I prepared harder. No, I kid you not. I prepared harder for those two messages than I ever have in all of my life for preaching. And I remember the one that I was gathered and there was 10,000, they, they were hanging from church, from windows and buildings. We were in this big courtyard that was surrounded by houses so people were hanging out windows and it felt like something out of a biblical scene and I'm up there preaching on spiritual warfare. Yeah, you heard that, White. <laughs> the white little kid speaking to India about spiritual warfare. It ranks as my worst message ever. <laughs> I mean, did you, ever, did you ever get up in front of people and realize while it's coming out, like, I ought to leave? <laughs> I just ought to, it's probably, be, like, probably the best thing I could do is just walk off right now, right? It was so bad, I sensed it in my being, and I know what some of you compassionate pastoral types are like, oh, Jim, bless your heart, the Lord was at work. I'm like, no, the Lord saw the seeds, he says, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I scattered these seeds and the Lord's like, eh, try again. Mm. It was pretty bad. And then I thought to myself, you know, I tried to calibrate and I went off to speak at this. This was just the pastors now, right? I delivered what I still can probably tell you is my second worst message to date. It's so bad. And then I decided to get off. Do any of you like, you start to get what I call, you just, you're off. You start to get lo- losing perspective and then that starts to spiral on itself And of course, you have all the fatigue of travel. You have the low blood sugar. You have the food you're not used. You add all this together, right? And all of a sudden, my condition is getting worse and worse down to the point like, oh my word, who am I? Am I really a minister of the gospel? I spent all my family savings account to believe God for this trip. And I just sink down, down and down and down. And I am waiting for the two and a half weeks to be over, right? And I am sinking into this spot. And then all of a sudden, Wick comes and goes, Jim, the night we're supposed to fly out, There's a church that meets underground just outside Delhi in a little village, and they want us to preach to them. They're going to gather everybody secretly. Literally, it was one of those ones where people were coming in because in that particular town, there was a good bit of persecution from the Hindus. And he looks at me and he goes, I'd like you to speak. And I was like, get behind me. I literally, I argued. I said, no, look, I really think. He goes, I need you to speak. You know what I did? I went and looked up another guy's message. First time in my life I ever preached someone else's message. Ten shekels in a shirt, I called it. The teaching from Judges 6, where a priest who was meant to be a priest unto God in the temple got offered money from a wealthy Israelite who built a little mini temple and said, come be my priest and I'll pay you ten shekels and a shirt every year. And the guy sold out his ministry. And I preached it, and I'm telling you, 
it came out so poorly. It was one of those moments where I actually think the translator just preached a different message. <laughs> you get nervous like that sometimes. You ever have this happen, Galen? You're like, something happened here that was disproportionate to something I did. And here you are preaching to a persecuted church. And I remember arguing with God, God, that is one of the most, that is one of the most repentance-oriented messages I've ever heard. And you're asking me to preach to a persecuted church a message of repentance when I feel like I have no authority in this area? And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit sat down in that meeting so much so that this one very well-dressed young man, maybe late 20s, early 30s, I could tell that the Spirit was starting to move on him during the message. And at the end, he jumped out of his seat and raced to the front because people responded. And he was crying. And he grabbed me by the collar and started to shake me. And he said... You described my life. That was my life. And he's standing there, and the spirit of repentance is on him. Long story, that man went, went on. I was told by the head of all the churches that we were driving to the airport, that's a young man that fell away from the church five years ago, and we've been praying for him. He's an up-and-coming, uh, one of the ministers in her parliament. And he says, we've been praying. It's the first time he's been in church in five years. The Holy Spirit falls on him. By the way, I stayed in touch with him for weeks and months afterwards. He's now a leader of churches in that area as well as still working in local government. It's just a powerful story. But isn't it amazing you can have a moment like that, but then I had to go rush into a car and drive to the airport, and guess what happened? Anyone guess? Right back down into my stuff. And I remember that drive just staring out the window at the India and the social condition and stuff, none of it getting to me. Lepers beating on the window. No, I was sitting there in this numbness. I get onto the plane. I remember Austrian Airlines. And they didn't close the door fast enough and the devil got on. <laughs> and he sat down right next to me. And I mean, it got laid on so thick. I am sitting there sinking deeper. I'm actually not even aware of Wick with me anymore. And I'm just going down. And then one of three times I've heard the audible voice of God in my life. I heard the Lord say to me, you are off, young man. He didn't hug me, yet I felt his love. He didn't let me sit in my victimhood or my low blood sugar or my international travel, my sacrifices, the money I gave to be there. He looked at me, and he knew I could be more. And he said, you are off, young man. And I'm not sure if you ever fallen under the conviction of God where he's convicting you and loving you in that same moment. That's the seven churches, friends. When these letters were read in the seven churches, they fell under the conviction and the love of God. May it be among us, amen. In one moment, the Lord said to me this, you are off, young man. And if I want to spend your money flying you around the world to lead one man to me, I will spend your money. And he nailed me to the wall because a few weeks earlier, I was preaching on faith and finances and how I had had victory in that area. He called to mind a breakthrough and a revelation he gave me. He said, you are meant for more, kid. Get up. Don't we all want that? It was a rough pruning, <laughs> spending weeks thinking about letting the Lord down. But I welcome it into my life. And now let me read to you. These are the closing words of our Jesus as he's wrapping up the seven churches. I want to read them over you. Chapter 3, verse 19, he's saying this to the church of Laodicea. If any of you feel like the ultimate underperformers or failures today, receive these words. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. 
I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I tell you I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Do you not think he deserves a church that obeys and walks in authority? I don't know where you're at right now, but if the Lord is putting a finger on you, I want you to come forward right now. I'm praying for us. If the Lord is putting a finger on something specific, would you please come right now? Let's sing this final song standing here together, saying to the Lord, prune me. For those of you who want more, it will require a pruning. These are dangerous steps, but take them, people. Take them. Jesus, we have ears to hear. And better is one day being pruned by you than a thousand where I'm praised by people who don't fully know you. I pray over the lives of the people who are responding to you today. Those who may be experiencing your finger on something. Those who are welcoming the deeper mood that brings authority. Mm. Mm. You deserve us. You deserve a church that looks like you. Lord, we welcome your work in our midst. Thank you, Jesus.
to worship as we close uh, this morning. And uh, I want you just for a second to consider what God might be speaking uh, to us as a body this morning. There were so many words that came this morning about breakthrough and strongholds crumbling. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm actually here as service pastor like okay, God, I got it. And then I keep getting confirming words that keep saying the same thing. So as I was praying about it, I really feel like there is breakthrough for those who have been seeking breakthrough. The picture was actually that the battle is raging and there's a break, there's an opening in the line of the enemy for you to be able to step through and actually see breakthrough. But here's the condition that the Lord showed me. The breakthrough has to be yielded to being pruned. Because some of us are seeking breakthrough on our own terms. And the Lord wants to give us breakthrough. And we actually need to yield our desire for breakthrough to be pruned. So I'm telling you, if you're here, if you if you're hearing my voice today or you're watching this online, there's an opportunity for you to respond in obedience and say, Lord, prune me, and the breakthrough that you're looking for is going to come. I've got a whole list of specific words of knowledge which I'm going to share, uh, but I'm inviting you, even as I'm sharing those specific words of knowledge, if that word about breakthrough, if that word about being pruned is for you, don't stay in your seats. Take a step towards that battle line that the Lord has sovereignly opened up and walk into the breakthrough that God has for you. I wanna invite the ministry prayer teams to come up to my left. They're gonna line up alongside the wall over here so that this space up front can just be set aside. We're not rushing off. We can take our time and just respond to the invitation for breakthrough, for the Lord to prune. And we're just gonna spend some time and kind of sit in that place. So while my prayer teams are coming up over there and maybe you're responding, some people are responding to the front about the pruning and the breakthrough of the Lord. Let me just read some of these specific uh, words of knowledge that we will minister to to, along with any other desires for prayer over along the left-hand side of the wall here. I want to highlight a word of knowledge for someone who has placed this weekend as a deadline for their marriage. And the thought is, if things don't change by this weekend, I give up. And the Lord wants to tell you that you are looking to the wrong person for change in your marriage. And if you will look to the Lord instead of your spouse, you will see the change and the restoration that you're looking for. We also believe that the Lord wants to heal elbows. There was a word of knowledge for elbows. 
So if that's you, we want to pray for you as well. There was a sense that there's someone here, someone uh, watching named Jason, who's wrestling uh, with this idea of suicide and my life is not worth anything. And if that is you, we want to pray for you and we want to show you what God thinks about you. There was just a, a sense of an awareness of God's pruning, uh, pruning and a call for us to be obedient and actually cooperate with the Lord's pruning. There was another word of knowledge about a woman that's facing barrenness. And we believe that there's freedom and release for God's promises and for life over your life in that situation. Healing in relationships, specifically between a father and a son that God wants to minister to this morning. Healing of a tooth molar. And if that's you, we wanna lay hands on you and pray for you and agree in faith for God's healing for you this morning. And then there was a word that came about someone or some people that are really wrestling with wounds and pain that they received in church. And that there's healing for them here this morning. And God wants to even begin a process of healing. The idea is that God is so redemptive that he can not only heal the wound, he could restore the relationship. And perhaps God might even be calling you to that place where you had been wounded to bring healing to other people as well. So Father, I thank you that just like Pastor Jim shared with the seven churches that you see each and every one of us, that you know us intimately. And God, as a body of believers gathered in this place, God, we just say yes to your pruning and the leading of your Holy Spirit. God, we take one step of obedience, knowing that your grace and your love and your kindness will meet us right where we are. Father, I ask that you bless this congregation with obedience and that you bless us to be pruned and to bear much fruit for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder that if you're here visiting this morning, the First Steps room is open with one of the pastors. They'd love to greet you and say hi to you. Don't feel free. Don't feel like you have to rush off. The worship team is going to lead us. We're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to us. Be blessed.